and welcome back to our final session for today's conference on why warnings matter. I hope we're pretty clear now on why warnings matter, um, but we certainly are, um, we have a lot of questions about how, how we can uh, get them to be more effective. So um, in the last session today, what we're going to be doing is showcasing some of the fantastic work that's being done by the UCL Institute of Risk and Disaster Reduction, PhD and M uh, Res students, master students. And of course, um, it has been a hugely challenging year for all of us, but especially those students who've had PhD projects or research trips that have been cancelled. And uh, it's been terribly difficult. Um, we hope that it's also spurred those students on to, to generate groundbreaking new insights and ways of doing research, which often is um, the, the kinds of things that emerge from these points of crisis can be incredibly exciting for the future. In order to guide us through this process, um, I'll be passing you to Shawhan, who will be uh, showing the videos of uh, the fantastic students' work today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the most inspirational session of this conference. This is IRDR PhD student showcase session, and I'm Xiao Han, a research student in UCL IRDR. The past whole year is full of challenges. Besides the pandemic that grabbing our attention, other threats like, other threats like climate change and food security still exist, and they are putting people in danger too. So in this session, we will show how the research has been conducted in IRDR for PhD students. Some of them has successfully finished their thesis and passed their test with minor correction. And some of few fresh face and ideas can also come in. People change, but the passionate of the research in IRDR and DRR are still highly inspirational, which doesn't change at all. If you have any interest on your research topic or project, please feel free to contact them. Their contact details are available on the IRDR website. Okay, I will take uh, slightly advantages as the host of this session. Again, my name is Xiao Han. As you already know, my research focuses on the individual risk that they are facing in the disaster risk threat and particularly for the question why you are suffering from the disaster impact, even comparing to the people who live in the same community. The strike of the hazard to community is commonly short, but the Im impact is a long-term issue. My research will answer that question about why that specific bunch of people suffered from the disaster. Again, I'm not hesitate to support the initiative about no natural disaster, as they believed, there are something behind what have what we have been seen and be visualized in the society. Now I will play the video that's made by our PhD student. I'm sure you will like it. Hello, my name is Miles. I'm a second year PhD student in IRDR and I'm researching prolonged field care theory, pre-hospital health for disaster risk reduction in remote environments and outer space. Prolonged field care is a military healthcare term that refers to the provision of healthcare in very remote environments. These environments have limited resources and limited accessibility, which are characteristics of remote health that bring together prolonged field care and remote health in this research. Why is this important? Despite the UN predicting that global urbanization will increase during the first half of this century, the UN also predicts that 3.1 to 3.3 billion people will still be living in a remote environment and all of those people require healthcare. Some examples include the provision of healthcare to remote communities, expedition medicine to remote environments, but then also military deployment to provide humanitarian aid. Some photos of my own experience include snowshoeing in the French Alps, building temporary emergency shelters in the snow, and then semi-permanent 
shelters in the snow, including this snow hole. The weather in remote environments is often very demanding, and this short clip is during Scottish winter. <laughs> research is putting together a theoretical foundation that will inform clinical practice in contexts such as this. There are two collaborators for my research, Remote Area Risk International and the Ministry of Defence Royal Centre for Defence Medicine. Thank you very much for listening. Hello everyone, I'm Salma Zajali, a second year PhD student at IRDR. My research topic is the decadal variability of precipitation in Oman and the assessment of cloud seeding in the Al Hajar Mountains, supervised by Professor Peter Simons and Dr. Simon Day. Oman has been classified as one of the arid and semi arid countries and is top ranked in receiving higher solar radiation intensity worldwide. However, it has significant variation in its topography and is subjected to different synoptic and mesoscale weather systems that interact with the highest Tehran region, causing intense rainfall spills and severe storms. Nevertheless, drought is dominant. From 2013, the government of Oman started cloud seeding operations over the Al Hajar Mountains in the northern part of Oman, as represented in the map with brown to white color scale to overcome water stress, the prolonged drought events, and the continuous depletion of groundwater. Interestingly, since 2003, the western part of the Al Hajar Mountains also has been exposed to seeding operations from the UAE. Therefore, the question which arose is how beneficial these cloud seeding operations are by the Al Hajar Mountains. Cloud seeding has not yet been proven conclusively effective due to the complexity of the microphysical and dynamical processes it involves. In addition, the scarcity of rainfall, the increased intensity of precipitation and global warming have all contributed to the intricacy for determining the visibility of cloud seeding. Therefore, this research focuses on assessing the cloud seeding project from a decadal variability perspective. This research aims to answer the following questions. What are the controlling factors of the extreme precipitation anomalies in the Al Hajar Mountains? What is the effectiveness of cloud seeding operations for rainfall enhancement over the Al Hajar Mountains in Oman? If the rainfall patterns in the Al Hajar Mountains are more influenced or less influenced by seeding operations of the UAE or Oman or both, how resilient is cloud seeding operations in Oman in terms of potential risks of destructive weather conditions that could be caused by it? The obtained results are used to evaluate the risks of flash floods in the northern region of Oman. Additionally, a strategic plan for managing the cloud seeding project will be developed to maximize the project's potential benefits and minimize its associated risks. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, my name is Mohammed. I am a third year PhD student from the UAE. In this video, I'll brief you about my project where I'm trying to answer the following question. Are earthquakes self-similar? And I mean, do earthquakes behave in the same way regardless of their magnitude? Let's start with an introduction. Although an earthquake may feel like a sudden shaking of the air surface, the motion around the fault can continue to deform the area for hours to years after the event. And this motion is called the post seismic deformation or the post seismic slip, while the actual seismic slip is considered as the co seismic deformation. In previous studies, medium to large earthquakes did not show any systematic relationship between the size of the co seismic slip and the size of the post seismic slip. In other words, the amount of post seismic slip seems to be independent of the magnitude of the earthquake. This is consistent with a self-similar model of earthquakes where large events are just scaled-up versions of small events. However, studies of small earthquakes in California showed large post-seismic slip following small events, indicating that the self-similar model does not hold. 
So my task is to investigate that in depth using borehole strain meter data from the USA and Japan. That is important to enhance our understanding of physical processes driving earthquakes, improve our fault slip models, and improve seismic hazard assessment. My results of 42 earthquakes with intermediate magnitudes, magnitude 4 to 6, which are at the middle of this figure, along with other 23 smaller and larger earthquakes, shows a clear trend of post seismic to core seismic slip ratio where smaller earthquakes have higher ratios or larger post seismic slip than larger earthquakes. However, further investigation is required to reach a final conclusion. Thank you. Oops, sorry, seems you have some problem in there, so don't worry. I will play for the individual one. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Aisha, a second year PhD student at IRDR Center for Digital Public Health and Emergencies. I'm working on developing an early warning system to predict high-risk area for mosquito infestation in Brazil. It's known fact that the increased abundance of the mosquito is typically associated with the standing water would serve as a hot spot for breeding. Also, it's essential to consider other factors, such as climate conditions, that drive the mosquito to increase in population size. These factors must be taken into consideration for the spatial and early warning prediction of the breeding hotspots for mosquitoes. Nowadays, remote detection and monitoring of mosquito infestation in real time are strongly needed to control the outbreak of mosquito-borne diseases. Recent advancements in technology should be employed, such as cloud computing, IoT sensor devices, smartphones, and GIS. The main objective of my research is to implement an IoT-based surveillance system to predict the sensor-based area that are at high risk of mosquito infestation using machine learning models, which consider the impact of the weather conditions and water parameters over a fine spatial temporal scale. The implemented model would incorporate the sensor, the, sensor, the sensor data generated by the IoT sensor devices and the on-field mosquito surveillance, which will be collected by the community health workers using a mobile surveillance application. The on-field mosquito surveillance data will be used to measure the system predictive validity and continuously recalibrate the developed model. The developed system will provide a prediction of infections area with the real-time data and hot spots map visualization as well as automatic reporting. Finally, despite the significant enhancement the IoT may add to the to the to a product such system, yet some limitation and jobs can be improved for for example, add some extra features for the mobile application, such as using the application to record any mosquito activity by capturing information relating to the presence or absence of the adult mosquito at a location in real time. Also, incorporating the data collected by the OVTRAP or INCTRAP into the developed model. This was a quick summary of my research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Aisha, for your good presentation. And now back to our next. So hello, everyone. My name is Sangeeta Thebe Limbu. I'm a first year PhD student at the UCL Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. Um, so my research is situated within the wider scholarship on gender disaster, climate change and environment. And in particular, I will focus on the gender and environmental politics in the Eastern Himalayas. 
Um, so the Himalayas are the mountain systems in the South and East Asia that pass through various countries such as India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, Bhutan, and Nepal. Um, so they're home to over 50 million people and an estimated 2 billion people rely on the Himalayan glaciers for drinking water, energy, agriculture, and more. However, climate change has resulted in melting glaciers and increased risk of glacial lake outburst floods, otherwise known as gloves. Uh, my research in particular will focus on the Eastern Himalayan borderland district of Nepal, uh, which is a region where gloves have occurred historically in the 1960s and 1980s. Uh, there are also long-standing concerns around landslides in the region, and in contemporary times, uh, new roads are being constructed, new hydropower projects are being introduced, the state-led conservation projects are being imposed and enforced, and labor migration has become an everyday reality for many households. So on the whole, the region is undergoing rapid environmental and socioeconomic changes. Um, so within those contexts, I will aim to examine the lived experiences of people in multi-hazard scenarios, as well as the conceptualization of risk and vulnerabilities by multitude of actors involved. Uh, I will be using a combination of ethnographic and archival methods um, with the broader aim to look at the gendered human environmental interrelations and change over a period of time uh, by bringing narratives of um, cultural history, environment, development, and migration together. Hello, everyone. I'm Lan Li, a PhD student in IRDR DPHC. My study is about addressing vaccine hesitancy the potential of theory-based social media interventions. Vaccine hesitancy is the behavior and psychological concerns that cause people who are able to access vaccine to avoid doing so, either at all or in a timely manner. We all know it will reduce the vaccine coverage rate and have impact on handling the infectious disease. Although lots of studies have tried to answer why and how the influence is, there is a lack of studies on how to solve or at least relieve this situation, especially when it links to people's actual behavior. By doing the systematic review, we know there are four types of social media interventions and the behavior theories that have been used in the addressing vaccine hesitancy. But vaccine hesitancy is a highly context-based problem, means there is no one-size-fits-all intervention. So next, we will choose a specific area and population to do in-depth research. We will focus on improving influenza vaccine uptake among people aged over 60 in China as a case study. We choose this population is because influenza coverage rate is only 5% among old people in China, while in the UK, the number has exceeded 70% since 15 years ago. What's more, there were more than 80,000 people died in China due to influenza, and nearly 90% of them are aged over 60. My research will include three steps. We'll first use survey to identify the behavior barriers for them to be vaccinated. Second, we will design the intervention content using behavior change theory and set four country groups using the four ways of social media intervention. Third, we will pilot and implement the study. At the same time, we would collect the data using survey and measuring the change of attitude and behavior. I'm Saskia Kaltenbrunner, and the title of my MRS research project is Accountability Gaps, Spatial Power Structures, and Notions of Territory in Post-Disaster Cañada Real. The aim of the project is to establish whether spatial manifestations of power structures create vulnerability to disasters, and who is responsible for reducing these vulnerabilities. I think this is better explained in connection with the case study I'm using, which is Cañada Real, Europe's largest illegal settlement located just outside uh, the Spanish capital of Madrid. 8,500 people live in Cañada Real, but as the settlement has expanded, most of it has been unregulated, to the point where, for example, since October 2020, 4,500 people have lived without power and the electricity company is unwilling or unable to fix the problem because only four houses are actually officially registered in the area. This has been an ongoing problem, made worse by the fact that the area of Cañada Real is split between three different municipalities, none of which take responsibility. 
In the last year, Cañada Real was first hit by COVID and then by snowstorm Filomena in January 2021. Now, the snowstorm caused chaos in the city of Madrid, but in Cañada Real it caused dozens of deaths. My research now draws on legal debates about who has the obligation to provide a safe space to live, and simultaneously on theoretical frameworks from the fields of sociology and critical geography mainly, that discuss what constitutes a safe space, how justice can be reflected in a space, and how the so-called fight for the city takes place on a political, cultural, administrative, but also on a geographical level. What can these debates contribute to our understanding of disasters and to the field of disaster risk reduction? I'm currently at the stage of data collection, which apart from desk research, consists of a series of semi-structured interviews with organizations based in Cañada Real. Welcome everyone. My name is Naib Arraheli. I am in the first year of my PhD at Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. I am going to talk today about my thesis. The title of the thesis is Assessing the Emergency Planning Requirements for Disaster Response in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. First of all, let me give you a brief background on the topic and aim of the thesis. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is exposed to different natural hazards such as earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, landslides, rock collapse, and flash floods after heavy rains. Flash floods have been the most common disaster documented in the emergency FN database during the previous few decades. The thesis aims to assess the emergency planning requirements for disaster response currently in place in the KSA, focusing especially on flash floods. So now we come to the next point, which is thesis structure and content. The thesis contains eight chapters. An outline of each is provided below. Chapter one, introduction. Chapter two, literature review on emergency planning and disaster response. Chapter three, the role of civil defense in the emergency planning in the KSA. Chapter four, methodology. Chapter five, the verification of a general directorate of civil defense officer receptions toward an emergency planning requirements framework for disaster response in the KSA. Chapter six, the validation of an emergency planning requirements framework for disaster response in the KSA. Chapter seven, discussion of results. Chapter eight, conclusion. Well, I have covered the point that I need to present today on the thesis. I would like to thank you to, for taking time out to listen to my presentation. My name is Rebecca Yaw. I'm a PhD candidate at the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction, and I work with Joanna Forwalker. One element of our latest research looks at housing and livelihoods in the Philippines before and after Super Typhoon Yolanda in 2013. We investigate whether vulnerabilities that exist before a disaster are perpetuated into the short and medium terms afterwards. We use housing damage experienced during the typhoon as one of these measures of pre-existing vulnerability and our longitudinal data to chart the recovery progress months and years later. Our findings so far show that vulnerability does perpetuate. If your home suffered the worst level of damage, complete destruction, not only were you more likely to have rebuilt to poorer building standards in the short term, but more likely to have used much weaker materials without any building expertise in the medium term. You were also more likely to spend longer periods of time in post-disaster temporary housing, such as evacuation centres or hand-built debris shelters. Longer periods of time displaced in these temporary housing measures were also positively correlated with increased likelihood of not receiving any post-disaster assistance or having to wait much longer on average for it when it did arrive. This means for our most vulnerable who were affected, restoring a sense of a previous existence pre-typhoon took a lot longer. It also more critically means that the aim of creating a much safer, more secure life and habitat simply didn't happen. For more information on this developing research, please contact us. Hi everyone, my name is Sagar Al-Zabi. I'm a PhD student from the UCL IRDR. I 
am from Oman and my presentation is going to be analysis of governmental responses to selected cyclone emergencies. So the formal system for emergency management in Oman is highly centralized. It's a command and control system. It focuses on national capacities and there is a severe lack of regional and absence of uh, local capacities. Uh, for managing crisis, the always uh, forming an ad hoc response coordinating committee that almost does nothing during planning, mitigation, recovery. The system is a largely governmental system with the voluntary and private stakeholders almost overlooked. So my interest is to understand how a system with these features would function under the different case studies. So the results of the analysis is that the response is a function of the emergency management initial state and the emergent conditions due to the interaction between the cyclone agent and the vulnerability of the place. The centralized command system would function in most uh, occasions under normal conditions and it did so in two case studies, Fit and Luban. However, it didn't function under a highly disturbed environment where critical failures obstructed the system to deliver its services to the isolated areas. So what happened in these areas when the emergency management system was unable to deliver its services? It was replaced by uh, an informal locally based uh, self-organized structure that uh, had um, different features than the formal centralized emergency management system. It was led by a civilian local agency and it was largely based on volunteer groups, local businesses and local agencies. Three fundamental lessons to be taken from these three case studies. One is localizing disaster response to the lowest administrative level. And two is engaging the non-state actors in crisis management. Three is that planning should be based on working under disruptive environment and not based on the assumption of the continuity of critical infrastructure services. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Hi, I'm Josh Anthony. I'm a first year PhD student and my supervisor is Katerina Stabrianaki. In my research, I'll be uh, investigating flood risk uh, in the Somerset levels in southwest England using a geophysical approach. Uh, this area is highly prone to coastal and river flooding um, and has an extensive network of artificial drainage works uh, to deal with this flood risk. So in my research, I'll be conducting electrical resistivity surveys along the abandoned river channels to see how the landscape has changed over time, uh, how it has responded to different natural and anthropogenic drivers, and also to map parts of the hydrological network. Uh, so this is done by, uh, in electrical resistivity, this is done by sending electrical currents into the ground and measuring the electrical resistivity uh, in order to characterize the materials beneath. Um, I'll be using this equipment here, which is electrical resistivity uh, kit, which I'm getting to grips with right now. <laughs> um, and then with these findings, I'll be uh, integrating them into a flood risk assessment uh, in order to contribute to the ongoing discussion in the Somerset levels uh, on how to best manage the flood risk there. Um, if you're interested in my research, I'd love to hear from you. And thanks for listening. Bye. Okay, thank you, Josh. And now we are going to the final poster from Qiu Shuangshi. Hello, everyone. I'm Qiu Shuang, the first year PhD student at UCL IRDL. My research is about community-based cascading risks assessment. For a city with a high degree of functional convergence like London, the interdependence of different systems could increase the possibility of propagating or amplifying the effects of the initial disaster event. 
flooding, for example, as one of the biggest risks facing London, its effects would have a national and international impact. Although some flood-related actions have already been implemented in London, floods are often treated as a single natural hazard with a lack of research on the cascading effects that triggered by a flood event. In the context of climate change alongside urban development, it is therefore necessary to develop a more comprehensive approach to decrease the negative impacts of flooding and its potential Okay, sorry, I thought it was posing the... To develop a more comprehensive approach to decrease the negative impacts of flooding and its potential cascading effects. My research plans to use the London borough of Hammersmith and Fulham as a study site located on the north bank of River Thames. The London borough of Hammersmith and Fulham is potentially more at risk of flooding than some other parts of London. And according to data provided by the Environment Agency in 2016, the London borough of Hammersmith and Fulham's town centre and critical infrastructures like emergency services, underground lines, and main roads are all at flood risk. The purpose of this study is to place the London borough of Hammersmith and Fulham in a safe flood event and to examine its potential cascading risks by using place-based disaster scenarios construction approaches. Specifically, instead of treating the flooding as a single disaster, this study is aimed to do a comprehensive analysis of the triggering event, its potential cause event patterns and consequences by measuring inherent vulnerability and the reasons behind the triggering event and analyzing the possible interaction paths of the vulnerability factors. This study attempts to explore sensitive nodes that may generate secondary emergencies and further visualize the potential structure of the event. Thank you. Thank you, Chu Shuang, for a very good presentation. And um, okay.